Okay, we're still waiting for folks to organize, get those banners out, flyers out. Okay, hi, welcome. I, you know, I, it's funny because I got it. I'm not sure which way to go, but. <laughs> My name is Alicia Boyd. And, uh, and I represent the citywide People's Land Use Alliance. And this is a citywide alliance of groups who have come together to basically state that the rezonings that have been occurring for the last decade in our communities have not been community led, they are developers led. And we're tired, we're tired. And so we come together to say no more. And in it particular, Oh, okay, yeah, let me just rouse you guys up. <laughs> no fucking more. We are tired of the bullshit. We're tired of the Euler process. We're tired of them saying that they want to hear our voices and then they walk the fuck out when we speak. We are tired of the top-down administrative rules about where development should go that's led by the real estate industry. Yes. Because that's all it is. It's real estate driven yes. initiatives underneath the guise of creating affordable fucking housing. Woo! That's never affordable for the, for the community that these developments happen. And we're tired of it. We're here today because Corey Johnson's bill. Johnson's bill is a simple giveaway to the developers. It's mandating that every community board have a plan of development, high rise development in their communities under the guise of creating affordable housing and equitable distribution. But really is, it's just a Trojan horse, another one. But it's worse than the Euler process because you only get two hearings. The same hearings where no one bothers to worry about whether you're going to be here, there, whether you're going to be listened to. The same hearings that we have in the EULA process. So we're here to say no to Corey Johnson's comprehensive bill. No! No! We're here to say that it's nothing but a top-down administrative plan to destroy our communities and to give them carte blanche to the developers. So instead of the city doing district by district and community by community, now they have the whole city in one swoop. That's it. A rezoning plan made by the city and then decided by the city, the mayor's office in particular. So we're here to say no. We have a, a long lineup of folks here ready to speak out from all parts of the city. This is not just Brooklyn, but this is Queens. This is Manhattan. This is the Bronx. Okay, we're all here to stand together in solidarity and say the Corey Johnson's bill got to go. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my piece of paper out <laughs> and I'm gonna introduce people. I was supposed to speak about my my issue, but I'm gonna wait a little bit and let other folks get go in front. So at first, I want to call Paul Di Bintito. Ben Bintito. <laughs> He's a 15-year veteran of Community Board 11 in Queens. He's also president of Bayside Historic Society the president of Bayside High School PTA and serves as a board member to the Queens County Farm Museum and Newton Historical Society. Here's Paul. Come on, Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, there's no togetherness in planning together. This was done in the last minute. It's based on lousy research, cherry-picked research. Um, if you want to have, if you want to plan together, if you want to have comprehensive planning, you involve all these people behind me in their communities. You don't do it top down, you know. As we heard, just heard, it's a giveaway to developers and to the real estate industry, and they don't care about affordable housing. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
It's a Trojan horse, thank you. That's what I was looking for. Um, I happen to live in eastern Queens. Um, a lot of low-density uh, low development. Uh, this would destroy us. If you noticed in, in, in the bill, it, they, they praise what happened in, in Minneapolis, and I believe in, in Portland maybe as well, how they got rid of single-family housing altogether. I know you guys don't live in a single-family house. You probably don't. I happen to. Um, but you know what? Oh, there you go. But no matter, no matter what you are, if you, if you own an apartment, if you own a home, that is your life savings. Amen. You you spend 30 years paying off a mortgage, you know? So for these people to come along and just destroy everything you've worked for in your life, that's a load of shit, okay? Woo! And and, right. and I'll tell you what, this bill, you can't polish a turd. This bill is a turd. <laughs> so let's get rid of it. Let's do some real planning. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Phil Simpson. He lives in Inwood, upstate Manhattan. He is a member of the Northern Manhattan is not for sale and Inwood legal action. It was one of the petitioners in the lawsuit that Inwood brought against the city of New York to stop the rezoning. He practices real estate and trust in estate law in New York City. Here's Phil. Thanks, Alicia. How are y'all doing? Um, that's right. Um, I'm from Inwood, upstate in Manhattan. Um, <laughs> and for four years, we were involved in fighting the Inwood rezoning. I've been involved with other uh, rezonings around the city. Mic up? Okay. Thank you. Um, and we've seen the administration just flatly reject any consideration of race refusing to see the racial injustice in land use. That was what one of the major uh, issues in the Inwood rezoning, and the city fought hard and unfortunately prevailed in the courts with not even having to look at race. Um, that's one example of how process matters. If you want good outcomes, you have to begin with good process. And I'll agree with Alicia and probably most speakers here that the current process that we have of Euler fails the people who live and work in our city. And that we need, while we need comprehensive planning, we need it for, among other reasons, so that neighborhoods are not required to go begging for the amenities, for the basic amenities that they should have in the first place in order to make um, deals with developers and their minions in the EDC and City Hall. Thank you. <laughs> um, you'll hear that this bill falls far short, but I want to speak to a different process issue, and that is the process of creating the bill itself. Uh, from where I sit, and I've been involved in, in land use issues for the last four or five years, uh, I pay attention. This bill just fell out of the sky. It suddenly was dropped on us. Um, with no input at the community board level, no attempt to get input at the community level. Um, it just was dropped on us, and people in neighborhoods uh, had basically no input in creating the bill at all. Um, I think if people who want comprehensive planning, and there are a lot of people in the city who do, if you go to the neighborhoods, if you go to Eastern Queens, if you go to upstate Manhattan, if you go to Bushwick and Crown Heights, if you go to Staten Island, to Red Hook, and talk to people, you'll learn what kind of process they think will work. Well, that wasn't what happened in the creation of this bill, and that's one of the major reasons the bill needs to be put in the shredder and start over. Thank you. I think it's really clear, people need to understand that we're not against comprehensive planning. We think comprehensive planning is essential in this city because we know that the real estate industry is what drives development. Wherever the real estate wants to develop, that's what winds up happening. But you have to have comprehensive planning that comes from the community. Because every community is unique. Every community has their needs, has their their parts of the community they want to preserve and protect. Yes. And yet the city has refused to engage in true comprehensive planning, and this bill is not that. This is a top-down administrative decree 
that developers will then have just carte blanche in our community. So the next person is Noah Almeida. Is Amira? Almeida. Almeida is an environmental activist. She's a Gowanus resident, so Gowanus in the house. And the member of the community group Voice of Gowanus. She works as a librarian at the City University of New York. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me here to represent Gowanus, Yay! where we've been fighting against the largest upzone in the last decade in New York City in a FEMA A flood zone on the banks of this famous Superfund site. Uh, like all of you who are paying attention to land use issues in your own neighborhoods, I know that current city planning processes are mired by corruption, yeah. bureaucracy, and suffer from lack of real community input already. These processes have contributed to inequity profound environmental issues and a housing crisis that has only worsened in the wake of COVID. However, the comprehensive plan introduced by Speaker Johnson is not a solution to these problems. Instead, it is a top-down hierarchical project that will prioritize growth as the blanket solution to the housing crisis. And we have all seen how this has worked so far. <laughs> this bill promises to fix unique community problems with a one-size-fits-all development solution without anything more than performative community consultation while giving a mayoral appointed director almost total control over the planning process. The reduction of community engage engagement opportunities is stark. As Alicia mentioned, there are only going to be two hearings through the whole process. There are no hearing requirements at community boards. Uh, during this process, who must choose one of three plans that are just decided by a director that's appointed by the mayor. There, there are no hearing requirements for the borough president, who must choose one of the three uh, proposals decided by the director. There are no hearing requirements for the long-term steering committee, also a mayoral appointee, uh, appointed group, who must choose one of the three plans. The, then, then the choices are getting, given to city council after only one hearing. And the council has to choose a plan. And if they don't choose a plan, then the mayoral director decides on the plan. <laughs> and that's, that's the process, okay? And the recent hearing about comprehensive planning, about this bill, I tried to watch it, it's seven hours long, um, is a great example of the kind of community input that the authors of this bill have in mind. The hearing took place on February 23rd. It wasn't until four and a half hours into the meeting that community members were given the opportunity to speak, at which point Speaker Johnson and many other city council members were no longer at the, at the hearing to hear from the community members. Even the minimal process of presenting this bill at, at CB meetings for input has not been done. They're not even bringing it to the community boards. And those would fail to reach all of the people who do not have access to the internet in this city, yes. which is many yes. people. Yes. They don't all have access yes. to technology. The thing is we don't have access. We don't have access. No, we don't. No internet, no voice. No, no internet, okay. no voice. No internet, no voice. I know this. I'm a librarian. We, we deal with this a lot, okay? Okay. Um, okay, where was I? Okay. <laughs> there are no there are no accommodations for low income residents who lack internet access or access to technology. City planning is in a crisis, but we certainly don't need a top down plan rushed through the council on their way out the door without community input Woo! to resolve it. So, I'm so glad that she brought this up because now it's my turn to represent my community. The Book and Botanic Gardens in Crown Heights. But I want you to I want you to know something. I'm with Gowanus. Because both of us filed a lawsuit. And what we said was that the Euler process, as it is, is racist and prejudice against low to moderate income people of color because it requires people to have access to the internet. Uh, at least 40% of the residents in my community do not have access to the internet. And that means 40% of the people will not be able to in participate in in-person hearings. So we have two lawsuits, we're in the courts, the court is trying to make the city adhere to this and do something about it, and guess what our mayor does? Our mayor decides to do an executive order on Saturday for five fucking days to sit there and remove our temporary restraining order. He stated that those 40% of those people do not matter. 
He stated that the low to moderate income families don't matter. That the seniors don't matter. That the handicapped people don't matter. Because he decides that in-person hearings is no longer going to happen with the EULA process. It's now going to all be virtual. But we got something for his fucking ass. Okay? We're going to drop another motherfucking lawsuit on him. Okay? Because we're not playing this bullshit. Excuse my French. Okay? We are not playing this. We are not going to allow the mayor to decide that 40% of the population does not have the right to participate in rezoning process. We will not allow it. How dare you? Shame on you, Mayor de Blasio. Shame on you with your black son and your black wife. Okay? As you paraded them in front of us during election time. Shame on you that you would disadvantage, you would take advantage of the fact that 40% of the people in my community does not have access to the internet and decide that they don't matter. Shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. Shame, shame, shame. Shame, shame, shame. And you know, this bill, and this is another thing that I have to talk about. This bill is being projected as an equalizer giving the opportunity for people of color to go into white neighborhoods underneath the mandatory inclusionary housing program. And yet studies have already shown the failure of the MIH to do anything but create middle class to upper middle class housing. There's no low to moderate income housing that has been created by the MIH program. It's a Trojan horse. This is not an anti-racist plan. This is a racist plan. This is not an anti-displacement plan. This is a displacement plan. Just like every rezoning that has occurred underneath the mayor de Blasio, where thousands and hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced because these rezonings come into our communities of color and rezone us under the guise of creating affordable housing that's never affordable to us, never affordable to the existing population. We are tired of the scams that the city keeps saying, but we need to create affordable housing. But this is not affordable. And this is not going to do anything but create more homelessness, as his plan has shown to do. So we are fighting back here. We are not taking it anymore. We are fighting back. Mayor de Blasio, you do not have the right to decide to do an executive order and change the law because you decide that the city should not engage in a legal lawsuit where an independent judge can decide for us what's right or wrong. We have an independent judge. She's there to facilitate and to ensure that there's a compromising position, that the people who want to participate are allowed to participate. How dare you decide that the court have that authority any longer. How dare you decide that you're going to take the rights of the courts and the rights of the people to be able to go to the courts and have this issue decided by an impartial person. No. It, we won't do it. We will not be doing it. We will be filing a lawsuit against the mayor and this executive order. You, you are not Trump. You are not Trump. You are not Trump and we're not gonna stand for it. No. Okay, that's my, my part. Now I'm, go <laughs> now I'm gonna go to Santa Scadillo, born in Italy. Born in Italy, he has been a resident of Little Italy since 1982. In 1998, he founded Lina, the Little Italian Neighborhoods Association, and has been advocating for all residents on overdevelopment and other issues affecting their increasing difficult survival in one of the city's most storied neighborhoods. Here it is. Thank you, thank you. And uh, the intro said, I, I didn't find it myself, I found it with neighbors. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, in case it's not clear, I am no, no, no on this wicked bill. I have a lot of respect for Kojo. Corey Johnson, his, many of his positions, 
the constituencies and the communities you represent, but on this is plain wrong. Wrong! As another speaker told, you can't polish the tar that fell out of the sky. I really <laughs> like that one. So, what we have to do is, this is just a symptom of a much bigger problem. The problem is called faithless elected. Not faceless electors like at the Electoral College. We have elected officials who start well and then they quote fall prey to the special interest of the biggest industry in New York City, which is well known is the real estate industry, which needs, yes, boo indeed, it needs no help in creating profits and jobs along the way. That's true. They don't need any legislative assets. They have everything. They have money. They have power. They can do plenty of damage already. So they don't need another help. What we need to preserve our communities is for the elected to understand that wealth and buildings don't make the city. The people do. And if you keep making the life impossible for the people of the city, what are you going to wind up with? I mean, we already have a show of power behind or in front of us, depending on where you are, this is what the real estate industry is doing. And they need to be curbed, not encouraged. Yes. They Woo. have to do the interest of the people because that's what this is all about. My neighborhood is a victim of cultural and ethnic erasure. They, we don't even have a name anymore. I am a statistical impossibility, according to the Wall Street Journal. There are no more Italians born in Italy. Hello! <laughs> and there are many more, okay? And we live in Little Italy. And it's not out of pride. My association is open to all people of all ethnicities, of all cultural proveniences, because it's about preserving our community. There are Chinese people, there are Hispanic people, there are Italian people who have been living for decades around me and around all of us. And this city has space for everybody. That's what makes it the greatest place in the world. And we have to preserve it the way it is. So no to this plan. The older process as is is not good, but it's better than the wicked plan that they want to impose of us. And I'll leave the mic to other people who will be as eloquent and possibly more than me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, um, I would like to introduce Arthur Schwartz, political director of the New York Progressive Action Network, a statewide organization built off the Bernie Sanders presidential campaigns and district leader in Greenwich Village. Thank you uh, so much. And I am, uh, I have a, a bunch of hats besides my Bernie hat. Right. <laughs> Thought it was fitting to wear it today because uh, that movement that Bernie started, that NIPAN is part of, is a movement about people power. Right. This is about people power, not politician power. I'm going to do two things in in my speech today. Uh, the first is I'm going to talk a little bit about history. Uh, Sixty years ago, there was a guy named Robert Moses. <laughs> Robert Moses, he remade a lot of New York City, but he wanted to run a highway right through the middle of Greenwich Village, through Washington Square Park. A highway, right? And a woman named Jane Jacobs, who just was a local yeah. resident, organized and took him on. And she wrote this great book, right? The Death and Life of American Cities. This is a Bible that everybody should read. It's still one of the most relevant books about urban planning that exists. So I'm going to do my little history thing. She said, I don't want to lose my Bible. She said, we shall, ha we shall have something solid to chew on if we think of city neighborhoods as mundane organs of self-government. Our failures with city neighborhoods are ultimately failures in localized self-government. And, and our successes are successes at localized self-government. There exists no inconceivably energetic and all-wise they to take over and substitute for localized self-management. Then she addressed the difficulty of standing up to City Hall. 
It is not easy for uncredentialed people to stand up to the credentialed, even when the so-called expertise is grounded in ignorance and folly. Then she talked about the role of the public at public hearings. This is what she said. Proceedings are heartening because of the abounding vitality, earnestness, and sense with which so many of the citizens rise to the occasion. Very plain people, including the poor, including the discriminated against, including the uneducated, reveal themselves momentarily as people with grains of greatness in them, and I do not speak sardonically. They tell with wisdom and often eloquence about things they know firsthand from life. They speak with passion about concerns that are local but far from narrow. We need to restore the concept in this city of local communities having a real say in the planning that goes on in those communities. And unfortunately, over the last eight years, it really started with Bloomberg, but it escalated under de Blasio. Our communities have been stripped of that power. I sat on a community board for 24 years. I know what it means to sit through zoning hearings and listen to the public and come up with resolutions and hope that the government was going to listen to us. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse over the last 12 years. I live in Greenwich Village. I happen to be a candidate for city council for District 3, which includes Greenwich Village, Chelsea, and Hell's Kitchen. My city council member is Corey Johnson. <laughs> By the way, a Corey Johnson who six months ago was suffering from depression and couldn't run for mayor, but now he's running for controller. <laughs> and he announced his controller candidacy right about the same time as they announced this bill. I wonder if there is a connection here. But look at what Corey Johnson did to our part of the city. Hudson Yards. Do you know that District 3, the district I live in, if you take out the two NYCHA developments, is 95% white. It's more white than any neighborhood in Birmingham, Alabama. 95% white. And is it affordable? No. Mayor de Blasio pushed MIH, and what did we get out of it? We, we didn't get any affordability in our part of town. Do you know what it takes in our part of town to afford a one-bedroom apartment? Minimum income, $71,000 a year. My daughter is a lawyer at Brooklyn Defender. She cannot qualify for an affordable apartment. Corey Johnson came out of the real estate industry. Whatever talk he makes about being a good guy and for the people, he came out of the real estate industry. He erased all that from the internet. But it was there before he ran. And now he is showing his true colors. And I think they said to him, Corey, you gotta run for controller. We need somebody in city government. We may elect a mayor that, that isn't pro real estate. We need you there. Our part of town, whatever the stories are elsewhere, it got implemented in our part of town. There is tower and tower after tower, upzoning, luxury apartments everywhere we look in, in Greenwich Village, in Chelsea, in Hell's Kitchen, and Hudson Yards, of course, was the ultimate example of that. We do have, we, this organizing is critical, and so are elections that are coming up on June 22nd. On June 22nd, look for those candidates who genuinely stand up to the real estate industry. Don't let them say, oh, I won't take money from real estate developers, because that the real estate developers will have their packs and support them anyway. Exactly. Look at what they say. Look at what they've done. Look at their history. Look at what they, who they've represented. Look at the lawsuits they've done. I, last year, I had to take on Mayor de Blasio so far unsuccessfully because the local community wanted, they needed flood protection in East River Park. So for years, there was work, local community groups, the community board developed a plan. And then at the last minute, the mayor said, no, I got a better plan. Let's put eight feet of dirt up and make a wall between and bury the park 
and make it unusable for the next 15 years. Right? That's the kind of that's the kind of planning. That's the kind of approach to government that we have to say no to, and we have to hold all of these people that are running for offices here, including me, uh, who's running against Corey Johnson's hand-picked successor, his chief of staff, who's going to continue the same policies. Look at the candidates in your communities, and also make a big point of. I don't care who you vote for controller, don't vote, make sure Corey doesn't win. Make sure he comes in sixth so that when he falls out, so when they do rank choice voting, he falls off the map. Thank you very much. Hi, so we're going, now we're going into Brooklyn, Flatbush. And uh, we're, come over here, Anthony. Anthony, Anthony Bedford. He, um, he is the head of the Brooklyn chapter, Black Lives Matter. And he has other titles. <laughs> but he definitely knows what it's like to live in a, in a low to moderate income community. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so, for no further ado, here. My name is Anthony Beckford, and I am the president of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn, but I'm also a city council candidate for the 45th district in Brooklyn, which is Flatbush, East Flatbush, Midwood, Marine Park, Kensington, and Flatlands. Yes, and bits of Canarsie. <laughs> you know, but right now we're facing mass displacement, and we've been facing it for a while. This is nothing new when it comes to our communities. This is nothing but a localized, weaponized imperialism against our communities. As Alicia said, we have nothing against comprehensive planning, but when that planning does not include the voices of the people, then it's not comprehensive at all. When you have those who cater to the Real Estate Board of New York, when you have city council members who sit there in their chambers and do not listen to the voices of the people, when you have a mayor who swears that he knows what's best for the people but has does nothing but stand against the beliefs of the people, we have a problem in New York. They cannot come to our communities and smile in our faces every two to four years and say they support us when they do nothing for us. When we're out here in these streets raising our voices and they refuse to hear them, then that's when we must shake up their foundations. We must show them that we no longer will take any word in that they say, because all it is is lip service. What we must do is march on City Hall, march on their offices, exactly march on their homes, and if you see them going out to eat, make your voices heard there. Because we should not feel uncomfortable for them to live comfortably. Right now, we're looking at a plan of mass displacement. We're looking at literally hundreds of thousands of our community members being thrown in the streets as they ship them elsewhere. I'm tired of seeing the homeless rate in New York City increase because these politicians, or as I call them, politricksters, do nothing for the people. Every single day, we face new threats from this administration. And those who want to kiss the behind of the speaker because they fear him taking away funding. Well, if they have no backbone in City Hall, they do not deserve to be in City Hall. The power of the people is what runs this city. The power of the people is what will help maintain and sustain this city. And if they do not bow down to the people, then they will tremble before the people. We will take back our communities before it's all gone. Now I would like to introduce 
Renee Hill a, from Jamaica, Queens. She's a community activist and leader. She's a member of the Queens Community Board 12 and the past chairperson. Renee was the executive VIP, VIP for the Queens Civic Congress, and she is here as a representative for those Southeast Queens residents that want to stop the intro 2186. Thank you very much. Now, I, I want to show this before I even start talking. This is the map of New York City. Mike, Mike, Mike. Oh, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? This is the map of New York City. You'll notice that most of the single family homes are in Southeast Queens, where the black minority uh, communities are. So what do you think the motive is? Already they started taking over our single family homes and making them multi-family. It's all about taking over real estate. It's only investors. It's not benefiting the uh, minorities at all. So it's important that we, we know that. The other chart I have is right here. We only have 15% single family homes in all of New York City. All the rest, Minneapolis, where they did this before, there was 70% and they had covenants where um, white uh, communities wouldn't allow uh, blacks or minorities to move in. That's why they did it there. Look at these others. We only have 15% single families in New York City. We need to preserve the small amount we have, especially since they're in the minority community. Um, we weren't able to move in some of the other communities um, uh, uh, years ago, so we all, we're all towards the Southeast Queens. And we need to keep that. That's that's our wealth right there. So um, it was clear to me early on that this plan was promoting the elimination of single-family zones in New York City. Although the sponsor claims it does not explicitly say so, it speaks uh, and it speaks admiring admire, Excuse me. It speaks highly of Minneapolis. Sorry. Speaks highly of Minneapolis. Uh, the, um, I'm sorry, it talks about how Minneapolis did that, though a vote for the whole council, so no one member would take the blame. So they, they have all these 23 uh, council members that some of them are, most of them are turning out. And these are the ones that are, are promoting this. And it recommends using the increasing affordable housing as a rationale for eliminating single family zones. We are not dumb. You don't have to spell out the plan for us to see where you are heading. Queens has 60% of the single-family zones in New York City, and in Southeast Queens, we have always been a community of one and two-family homes. That is why we, many of us have moved to our neighborhoods, for the characteristics of it. Over the last 10 to 15 years, many of our communities have been down-zoned because developers were building, uh, building uh, high-rises and um, turning them into multiple, multiple, multiple dwellings. That is what will happen if this proposal becomes law. There are ways to increase affordable housing without destroying the character of our neighborhoods. It is clear that developers were angry that some council members and some communities blocked their plans for development. This plan is a clear effort to change that. It aims to limit any council member's ability to change or block plans that are opposed by their constituents. Some of the goals of the plan are worthwhile. But the way it goes about reaching those goals can be dangerous and unfair. We need to stop until 2186 and come, with, uh, come up with a fair, comprehensive plan that really does plan together. So I'm, I'm very angry, especially after seeing those, um, the maps that I brought Matt, with me. Margaret, thank you. I'm very angry uh, because it looks like it's, it's just about taking over Southeast Queens. And uh, uh, as um, I am running for city council, and we have to make sure that we pick uh, city council members. I know I was supposed to say that, I'm sorry. But everyone else said it. Everybody else said it. So. Um, but we do have to know who uh, who our city council members are. We have to do our research and we have to know. I had a landmark at Asley Park. I care about how the characteristics of our communities are and I want to keep our single family and, and well, uh, maybe two family homes. But it, it, we do not, we don't have the infrastructure in Southeast Queens. And they're not even talking about um, maybe doing that after they zone it. We don't need, we need to have a fair and rely, uh, responsible planning. So um, I just hope that everyone does your research when you pick your new city council person and make sure Corey Johnson does not become, uh, become, uh, become our controller. Thank you. Okay, now we are at Paul Graziano. Um, he 
She's a lifelong resident of Flushing, New York, and a principal of the Associated Cultural Resource Consultants. He's an urban planner, a historic preservationist, and a land use consultant. He is the designer or co-designer of over two dozen neighborhood-wide contextual rezonings in New York City, and the co-author of the R2A Anti-Mansion Zone, Paul Graziano. Hi, everybody. Uh, everybody can hear me. I I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to just. Um, a lot of great stuff was said today, um, and uh, the first thing I'm gonna say is, we have an anniversary today. Do you know what the anniversary is? It's three months to the day that this bill. I'm gonna pull this off because my glasses are fogging up. I'm sorry. Everybody can hear me, no problem? It's been exactly three months since Corey Johnson uh, dropped this bombshell on, on the city of New York. December 16th was the day that Planning Together came out. And in those three months, we have seen unbelievable anti-democratic behavior by the speaker, by the council, uh, through their hearings, the mayor has been very anti-democratic for seven years plus, but that's a different story since someone mentioned his name. But the one thing I do want to say is this. I'm a planner, and I'm an advocate and an activist, and I've been pushing for the protection of neighborhoods throughout the city for the last 20 plus years. Um, what, what this, the difference of what has happened over the last seven years versus what happened in the previous administration was there was at least an attempt in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, to work with communities. There was community-based planning, not on every plan, but on many plans. And I actually rezoned many of those neighborhoods. I was one of the people who designed those rezonings. So I know it happened. The day that Mayor de Blasio came into office, that ended. This bill is going, it's not a comprehensive planning bill. It's a comprehensive overdevelopment bill. It's a comprehensive real estate uh, housing plan. That's all it is. The whole idea of comprehensive planning is to tie all of the things that make life happen together. This is not what this is doing. When you look at comprehensive planning, I've actually written comprehensive plans for towns in New Jersey and in other places. You give equal weight to all of the issues. You give equal weight to housing and parks and infrastructure and historic preservation and open space and all the things that make a town or a city work. This doesn't do that. It's, a, it's even in the language of the legislation. The legislation itself states opportunities for housing based on population and, quote, everything else. <laughs> so when you lump things into two categories rather than 10, 12, 20, or 30 categories, that's a red flag right there. I have gone through this legislation with a fine tooth comb. Uh, for all the media folks, I'm happy to forward you my documents, which I think you might want to read. And one of the reasons I, I'm bringing this up, and I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but one of the key things that came out of this, and it has been brought up by a, a lot of the other speakers today, is that this does not address the things that it's supposed to address. This whole description that that there was, uh, um, how do I describe it? The, the way that it's written over and over again in the Planning Together document and in previous things from the de Blasio administration, which this is copying, is that when the contextual zonings happened during the Bloomberg administration, they happened in white, wealthy neighborhoods and low-income neighborhoods of color only got up zonings. Now, I'm standing here with Renee Hill. I helped Renee rezone 80% of Southeast Queens. There she is. Uh, I, I live in Flushing. My community is 75% Asian American. We rezoned our community. I've, I've worked in all over Queens, all over the city doing this. It just didn't happen that way, okay? The bigger issue here is that the upzonings that have occurred under the de Blasio administration, and I'll give East New York as a perfect example, the five years that it took East New York to happen which happened against the community's wishes, very much so. The speculative value of the property based on the rezoning went up over 500%.
So you have to think, who is this benefiting? Because even if affordable units are being built, when you look at the average, the way that things go up in price over a, a scale, if the, if the ground value has increased 500%, well, then the affordability overall has gone down, even if some token affordable units have been built. And I think this is the big issue here, is that it, it's a scam. Uh, MIH has not been, it has not worked, it never did, because there is no deep affordability, number one, and it's set up as a real estate program, not as a program to help people. This, this is all based, and I want every, all the press to understand this, this is all based on a report that came out 10 years ago by the current deputy mayor, Vicki Bean. This report stated this is where the statistics came from that neighborhoods of color were upzoned and white wealthy neighborhoods were taken care of. This report, I read the report, 80% of her data is wrong. She has used this report to justify upzonings for the last seven years, very unfair upzonings for the last seven years, and this is now the core pillar of planning together. This is the core pillar. So this is very important for everybody to understand that you've got this administration running this phony agenda, and now you have planning together looking to lock it in in 10-year cycles in perpetuity. This is extremely dangerous. And frankly, the deputy mayor should be investigated for this. And I say that in all seriousness because she falsified her data at the NYU Furman Center, which she ran, and she was the co-author of this report. She falsified her data. She then conveyed that into the position of commissioner of the Housing Preservation and Development under de Blasio, and then became deputy mayor. Mm. Using this data and these fake arguments to justify these extremely damaging rezonings that have happened over the last seven years, and this horrendous bill which will lock it in and remove the few members, the few members who have fought against this over the last few years, like with Industry City with Carlos, for example, where he did the right thing at the end, okay? Or, or even in my neck of the woods, where Peter Koo did a similar thing, not with the West Flushing rezoning, but with another one, where Corey Johnson tried to get him to vote at the Land Use Committee and they pressured him so hard, and at the end of the day, he literally, and if you know Peter Koo, he's a very mild-mannered human being, started screaming at Corey Johnson, telling him, I will not go against my constituents. I won't do this. And they pulled the, they pulled the ULERP 10 minutes before the vote because of that. So you have a few people who have at least something of a backbone, but the fact is, this will take away member deference. It yes. will yes. cook and bake these up zonings every 10 years in every community board, whether you're the dense Upper East Side or the lowest density areas in Queens or Staten Island or Brooklyn or even the Bronx, it's going to be a perpetual development machine. Yep. We have to have our communities making those decisions. Every single elected official should be absolutely raked over the coals. And frankly, I also know for a fact that at least half of the people who signed on as co-sponsors never even read the legislation. And that's appalling, and many of these people are running for other seats. So with all of that in mind, I've said enough. I'm gonna turn this back to Alicia. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Oh, and please sign our petition. Yeah, yeah there is a petition the online that Paul um, sent around and got quite a number of people, right? Three, couple, over 3,000. Over 3,000 uh, people involved in that petition. Now, we are going to go to, and I need to get my paper. Austin Shafran is a longtime resident and community activist from Bayside. Here he is. Thank you, thank you. 
So this may seem odd, but I'm here to announce my support for Planning Together under one condition. <laughs> they changed the name to Tearing Apart, because that's the lie that we've been told, and we need to be honest with ourselves here. This plan will do absolutely nothing but tear communities apart, but strip our communities of the role they have in the development that defines our communities. Our neighborhoods, as we know them, as we have come to know them, as we would like our children to know them, will cease to exist. I'm a city council candidate in Northeast Queens, but that doesn't matter. I'm here as the father of two young children, as the son of two 50-year Northeast Queens residents. It is my job, it is my duty, it is my responsibility, it is my honor to help protect the character of the community that was handed down to me, that I hope to hand down to my children. And if we think this plan is just about housing and would wreak havoc just in our housing, then think again, because it's going to hurt our schools, it's going to hurt our infrastructure, it's going to hurt our transportation. It will demolish the character of our communities. It will strip our communities of our power, and it will certainly and definitely not lead to any creation of affordable housing. Whether you're in Northeast Queens, whether you're in Brooklyn, whether you're in Southeast Queens, long-time residents will be displaced. The single-family homes that they have worked generations, that they have spent and saved for lifetimes, will be stripped away from us, and we will see mass displacement and mass gentrification of those same communities. This one-size-fits-all plan fails all communities. We are not Minneapolis. We are not Seattle. We are New York. We are New York, and this is not our plan. This is a plan for developers. This is a plan that would create a loophole so big and so wide, it's a parkway that would make Robert Moses blush. <laughs> and we're here today because we're here to say no and we're here to stop it. And whether it's the current council or the new council, there are community members across this city that are lined up to say no. We will not lose our power. We will not be stripped of our role in the development process because we are the ones that define our communities. Thank you. Now I want to introduce you to Emily Sharp. She is from Sunnyside. She's an attorney. She has been fighting development in her community, and she's also a part of the citywide no rezoning coalition. I know I helped to make that name, and I'm still not remembering it very well. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on, Emily. <laughs> Woo! Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, not much to add too much more now but what I do want to say is when the comprehensive plan came out it was a really cold day just like this in December and we we're all standing around here saying we didn't want uh, the racist rezonings so this is what this is going to be a racist rezoning it was interesting that it came out the same day but um, when I first looked at this plan I've, I've done a lot of research for Stop Sunnyside Yards that I founded and I did research on the EDC and um, Empire State Development Corporation and uh, the Partnership for New York City. It's all, I was like, wait, we already have top-down planning. All those things are top-down planning. We don't need this comprehensive plan that's gonna destroy us. So that was interesting. So it was a big scam right off the bat. I didn't have to do any research, I just knew. I looked at the glossy, you know, planning together. They all look the same, <laughs> same kind of language. <laughs> like, this is a scam. Yeah. And then, of course, Felicia confirmed right away. So anyway, so that's what I was going to say, just from doing so much research, knowing that this is a scam right off the bat. But um, one other thing that I've learned over the last year, probably, that just the AMI is a construct for racism. It just it is. It's, yes. They keep making it like everything has to. We have to use the AMI. Well, there's also like a poverty index. Why aren't we using that? Why do we have to use anything at all to like decide the housing, like who gets to go where? Anyway, so... That's just pretty much, I definitely kind of came to that realization that the AMI is a way just to be racist and um, because it doesn't even get to like um, people earning minimum wage, a lot of the lower, like the 40% bans. We're dealing that with in Queens. So that's really what I had to say. Um, so yeah, who else? Oh, oh, 
Actually, um, I wanted to bring up city council people like Victoria and me, and who else is left here? Anybody uh, else? <laughs> I was gonna, Anthony. 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 And um, Renee, is she still here? Come up here. I just want us to take a pledge, city council people that are running me and you and Anthony and Victoria and Marnie. Yeah, she's not here, but we're representative. Um, so I just want to say that I'm, I pledge, and I'm going to ask you guys, when we get elected to city council, we're going to repeal, well, hopefully stop it, but repeal, if we have to, repeal this comprehensive plan. Uh, Hell and yeah. so, yes? Yeah. Hell yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 On behalf of Marty, how long I say yes? Yeah. Yeah. Emily Sharp, we will all, and Renee probably will too, she had to leave, but, so yeah, that's our pledge to all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have Victoria Cambrere from uh, Gowanus, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Steve Levin's district. We know Steve Levin's, right? Thank you so much, Alicia. All right, I'll be super quick because everyone is freezing, it's snowing, and we all want to get a hot drink after this. Um, my name is Victoria Cambranes. I'm a candidate for City Council District 33. I'm born and raised in Greenpoint, which used to be a working class immigrant, um, a community full of people of color, full of people from all around the world, and who, who came there to try and find a sustainable and affordable place to live. That is no longer the case. We were the guinea pig in 2005 for the Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning, which was a complete and utter disaster. It displaced my family, displaced my friends, displaced my neighbors, and everyone knows it was a disaster. We don't want this same pattern repeated. I have sued developers who have literally said in emails that they are using the Williamsburg blueprint it's a catchphrase, for fuck's sake. <laughs> so, why are we as Democrats, as a Democratic city, with a Democratic mayor, a Democratic city council, we have a supermajority in Albany of Democrats, we have a Democratic governor, we have a, a majority in the Senate, a majority in the Congress, we have a frickin' Democratic president, and yet, and yet, we are using Reaganomics, trickle-down Reaganomics, for our housing policies. This is nothing but trickle-down housing. So let's repeat that. Trickle-down housing. Trickle-down housing. Trickle-down housing. Trickle housing. This is exactly, exactly what we are trying to fight. We are fighting Republican policies. Republican economic policies. We are Democrats. We should act like Democrats and we should protect and preserve the communities that are vulnerable to displacement, vulnerable to gentrification, and who have suffered enough already. So thank you very much and let's stand together. I think that. Um, uh, uh, are we finished? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming thank out. You, Mary Nicole. Thank you. Woo! Woo! And thank you so much. Woo! And we'll see you the next time. Woo! All right, let's go get a hot chocolate. <laughs>